Hello everyone, Cat Weasel here, welcome to the channel and welcome to our new playthrough which is going to be Lobotomy by Titan Forge Games where we will be, well at the start at least, we will be playing the scenario Asylum Field Day. We may do more than one, I'll explain more about that later. So we're going to do the setup and introduction video. So. Uh, I'll show you how to set up the board, I'll go through how many characters we've picked, we'll go through each character and we'll go through the scenario itself. It is a bit involved, the manual for lobotomy, the rules um, are not the best, they're by no means the worst and uh, they are they're totally usable but um, you might struggle with it when you first start. Like anything, once you know how to set the game up and stuff it's an absolute doddle. The problem with the, the lobotomy rulebook is it doesn't actually have any player aids and uh, you've uh, got to go elsewhere to find uh, glossaries and, and things like that which can make it a little bit hard at the beginning. Everything is in the manual, it's just a question of finding it and without player aids it's a bit more difficult. But in that case, uh, Board Game Geek is your friend. If you go to the lobotomy page on Board Game Geek, uh, you can actually find a thread there, which is uh, written by a guy called Judgment Dave, and he's brought together all sorts of player aids and stuff that will make it a lot easier for you to set up the game and get going. In addition to that, it's also got details on which scenarios are the easiest, so it ranks them from easy to hard. It's got pictures, it's got a file with all the pictures of the uh, map tiles, shows you where to place everything it's extremely useful I've used it myself and I will put the link down in the video description and in the comments below so please use that because it will save you a lot of time you can do it using the manual itself but it's a step-by-step -step process and it may take you a while yeah so uh, anyway I'll go through that shortly uh, just before I do just a couple of points um, Firstly, and most quickly, I uh, just want to apologise for my voice. I do have a bit of a cold. Hopefully it will hold out and uh, I won't lose my voice. But uh, if you're wondering why I'm uh, sounding extremely husky, well, it's not because uh, I have a sexy voice or anything. It's just because I have a cold. Okay. And uh, the next point I want to go through, and a more serious point, is regarding the theme of this game. Now this game is set in a psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane. It's a horror game. It has a very dark theme, very dark indeed. Um, some people may not want to play it with children, for example, because of the nature of what is on some of the cards. So it is a deeply horrifying theme. In addition to that, I'd just like to go through the horror theme of the asylum that's depicted here and real life. The mental illness and the psychiatric care and the hospital hearing contained within lobotomy is in no way meant to reflect real life. It's just a uh, pastiche on well-worn horror motifs, cliches and pastiches available in general media. So, for example, if um, some of you may play the Batman video game, uh, Arkham Asylum, nobody would expect Arkham Asylum is a, you know, proper representation of a mental hospital. It isn't. It's just a representation to stick the Joker in there and various other supervillains super who take over the place and then Batman's got to sort it out. Similarly, you know, in graphic novels, in literature, even Dracula, uh, Dracula itself has a mental institution in it where the lunatic Renfield is incarcerated and he's the guy, I don't know if you remember, he's the guy who ate flies and then he starts eating spiders to eat the, eat the flies and everything and uh, he's sort of um, instrumental in bringing Dracula over to England and eventually Dracula turns up in his cell and all that sort of business. Again, that was not an accurate representation of a, a mental institu institution or of the mental illness that Renfield had. It was just something Bram Stoker wrote in order to uh, make it extra horrific. And uh, you'll see that 
I mean, the asylum and the mental hospital, the psychiatric institution, is just a well-worn trope in horror literature, in horror media, in horror films, things like Shutter Island, for example, and uh, there's an American Horror Story. That's a series um, that's on at the moment. There are several seasons, and each one has a sort of different horror topic, and I believe one was called Asylum. Well, in that... That is in no way, you know, an accurate representation of a psychiatric hospital or mental illness or psychiatric care. It just isn't. It's just using the horror cliches for asylums and um, just try to scare the pants off you. Exactly the same with this game. It is not an accurate representation of mental health, of um, psychiatric care or of any sort of mental hospital anywhere yeah so uh, just to bear that in mind because while we're playing the game obviously i'll probably make some off the cuff jokes and and things like that um they're not against real mental illness yeah it's just uh, if if anything i'll just be taking the mickey out of the well-worn horror tropes of um, asylums for example you know the sort of thing um you, you sit down to watch the film and somebody goes into the mental hospital and they're investigating some strange goings on. And then in the last 10 minutes of the film, the rug pull is that the person doing the investigating was mad all along. You know, we saw it coming a mile off. That's the sort of rug pull they used like three million years ago in the prime in, primeval swamp. It's obvious. It's like the old ghost one, you know, where somebody will go to investigate a ghost story. And uh, in the last 10 minutes, it turns out that everybody he's been speaking to for the previous two hours was a ghost as well. You know, it's all cobblers. You know, it's just... <laughs> it's just obvious. We've, uh, we've, we've had all those sort of rug pulls before. We know what happens, yeah? It's exactly the same with this game. It's based on the horror representation of asylums, not real asylums. So just to get that out of the way. Okay the game itself and set up as i've mentioned it's a bit difficult to set up just using the rule book so go and use judgment dave's uh, downloads they're very useful and uh, let's get straight into what we had to do now the board itself is made up of a central tile it's just a very small central tile here and uh, it's got a very easy to find because it's got a pentacle on it there i'll just move that i'll tell you what that is later the uh, the token i just moved out of the way and it's very small tile and it's got a series of letters in each corner so there's an a a b a c and a d a always goes at the top left hand corner and about that we will place four quadrant tiles now the tiles you place they can be completely random or a scenario that you choose may specify a tile if it specifies a tile a particular tile you find it and you'll put it in a here it will always go in position a as it is asylum field day the one we're playing has no specification so we've just picked a few out just to give you an example of what was picked out this is the water tower tile in the uh, top left hand corner top right hand corner that's more like a uh, day center a visitor's lounge up there and uh, bottom right hand corner down here this is the offices so the warden's office is actually here that's the warden's office and uh, on the bottom left hand it's actually the entrance tile so if you can see here there's a bit of an ambulance here it's been all smashed up there's another body in reception <laughs> that token that's what that token is there and uh, you've basically got the main reception desk here and all of these quadrants surround the isolation cells which is this center tile and that's where you start the game so uh, your characters are in the isolation cell in the center tile now that is general setup you'll have the center tile and the four other tiles around it you can have a bigger a bigger game board there is another tile which is this one again double sided just to show you that they're double sided this one has actually got the same thing on each side but this is called a corridor tile and we could sort of put that over there add it over there and then two more of these quadrant tiles would fit around it so you could actually have a big six tile board yeah just around here but generally you'll just use four uh, just to give you some idea of 
what the tiles look like that aren't the ones that aren't actually uh, the ones that aren't actually on the board at the moment. I'll get some from the from the deep expansion. So these are slightly smaller, but it just shows you the double sided. Yeah. So you have plenty of replayability with these tiles. You've got about ten, and uh, the double sided. The inside and outside as well, you have things like the gym, the chapel, you'll have the garden. They've got a little garden as well that you can go in. So you get plenty of replayability as far as the tiles go. And as I say, the odd scenario may require you to put a specific tile out, but it's generally just the one. And that goes in the A quadrant just up there. Right, so we picked our tiles out, we put them on the board. Fantastic. What do we need to do next? Well, first of all, what I like to do is we take the Warden. Now, this is the Warden. As you can see, he's a boss monster. And actually, he's more of a timer in this game. Uh, you don't want to bump into him because uh, if you ever end up on the same space as him, then he will give you a tremendous hurting. He does something called a stomp and he will basically just attack you once and uh, he's got a good chance of killing you as well but um, he'll just attack once and uh, so it's just best to stay out of his way he won't hunt you during the course of the game um, you actually only have to face him at the end of the game but uh, I've got a little house rule about that but generally at the end of the game when you run out of time then uh, he'll come looking for you then and you face off with him in that central tile but um, during the course of the game he acts as a timer each quadrant so each tile that you put in a quadrant does have 12 numbered spaces on it there are more than 12 spaces on each tile but only 12 of them have a number on and they're numbered from 1 to 12 and the timer works by when you get told to move this guy he starts on A1, which just happens to be there on that particular tile, and then he'll move to A2. Then he'll move to A3, 4, 5, 6, and as you see, he'll do his round of that particular tile. Now, if you do one scenario, a single scenario, he will finish up on here. And that is space 12 of tile A. Then the round after that the game has finished because you're only doing one scenario you have run out of time then he will come to the middle of the board here and you'll have to fight him except we won't be doing that because that's my house rule we don't fight the warden why don't we fight the warden because you haven't got to hope in hell of defeating the warden and it's just a waste of time <laughs> this is an extremely difficult game and this is why I'm going to do a couple of house rules I'll go through them as uh, we meet them but uh, this game does require I think a few house rules uh, if you play it rules as written you'll just get beaten and you'll get beaten badly so badly it's not even fun I don't think so uh, especially you know if you've just got the game I'd recommend house rules but it's up to you but as I always say if house rules make it easier for you and they will make it easier for me in this game then do them Personally, I think this game is a little too difficult. Uh, the difficulty is normally scaled on the amount of scenarios you do. So if you do one scenario, that's meant to be easy. Two scenarios, normal. Three scenarios, difficult. Four scenarios, very difficult. What it's more like is one scenario is extremely difficult. Two scenarios is idiotically difficult. Three scenarios is almost impossible and four scenarios is absolutely totally impossible now you may get some people that say like oh i've done four scenarios and one well i'd say to those people well well done to kick off with say very well done indeed and then i'd respectfully suggest that they went back and had a look at the rules because i have a feeling they will have messed a couple of them up because rules as written i think you've got no chance of doing four scenarios and uh, when you're doing more than one scenario what happens is the timer track uh, goes up so for one scenario he just goes around the 12 here for two scenarios he he then move across to the b tile and go around the 12 there if you're doing three scenarios move on to the c tile and four scenarios obviously he'd come all the way down here so he'd end up having 
you know, 48 movements, yeah, to uh, do a four scenario, um, a four scenario game, or around 48. There are some times he doesn't move. There are some ways you can move him back, but there are not many. But uh, generally what happens, and one of the reasons why this game is so hard, is uh, you run out of time. You just run out of time so quickly. So, if I don't, at the end of a timer, if I don't end up here fighting the big bad, what, what do I do? Well, as soon as he hits the timer limit, I just go, right, lost the game. But then I carry on. Because I use the timer as a sort of... Um, I was going to say victory track, but it's more of a lost track. So, <laughs> say we were just playing the one scenario and he got to 12 and we hadn't finished, we hadn't achieved our objectives. I'd just carry on. So I'd move him over to B1. And then he'd go to B2, B3. And I'd carry on trying to like complete the scenario I was on. And say I completed the scenario I was on, achieved all the objectives, and I was on space 4 over here. Well, I'd say I'd lost the game, because I had, I hadn't done it in time. But I'd say I'd scored minus four. Yeah, so I'd done four extra movements of the Warden than I should have done. So we lost it by four extra movement, or four chronons, or whatever the hell you want to call it. And that way, because you're not wasting your time fighting the Warden, because he will crush you. It's just, um, it's it's even worse than Arkham Horror 2nd Edition and fighting a, a, an a great old one just he will just absolutely annihilate you and um, so you just lost there by minus four yeah if you play the scenario again you might uh, you might either do it in time in which case you've won or you might do it to, you might have gone on to B1 in which case you've lost it by minus one but it gives you a better gauge of how you've done yes rather than just fighting the warden in the middle of the board and just getting annihilated so that's the way I play it. The other thing as regarding difficulty is you're meant to choose your difficulty right at the beginning. So you go, oh, I want an easy game. I'll play one scenario. Or uh, now I'm on game, I'll play two. I don't play it that way. Another house rule is I make my mind up as I go. So I might be doing the first scenario and I might think, oh, I'm doing quite well here. I'll do another scenario. So I'll just tack one on. Yeah, that's not how you do it in the rules as written, but it's how I do it. Because um, if you were to say, all right, I'm going to do four scenarios. I'm going to go crazy, difficult, hard, almost impossible four scenarios. You feel like you've locked yourself in and you're committed. Yeah, no pun intended. But you feel like, all oh, right, I'm committed to trying to do that now. And this game is so difficult. You might be halfway through the first scenario and you might realise you've got no chance of winning. And there's nothing more annoying than, you know, just slogging away when you've got no chance whatsoever. Yeah. And uh, then if you just quit, you know, you go, oh, right, so I forget it, quit. Then you feel bad, you know, because you sort of like, um, you said to yourself you're going to do four, but you haven't even done one and you feel bad. And why should you? It's only a bleeding game. So the way I do it is... I start the first scenario, if I'm doing okay, I'll go into the second one. If I'm still doing okay, I'll go into the third one, and so on, yeah? Uh, if I run out of time, I run out of time. Uh, if I think I can still finish the scenario, I'll finish it, and then I'll do that sort of negative victory track and um, calculate how much I lost by. But uh, generally, I will not meet the warden in the centre of the board because it's just a waste of time. Um, if you've got a chance of winning, you know, even a small chance of winning, then fine. But when you've got absolutely no chance, it's just not worth doing. So that's what we do. So he's a timer. Um, the only time he will uh, really, like, beat up on us, because I don't do the final battle, is if he actually lands on our space. So, uh, but you know what his track is, and you can generally avoid him. Remember, we're insane. He looks like a massive, like, hulking demon there. In reality, it's probably just... It'd be the hospital administrator, he's got a clipboard and a suit on. He's just wandering around making his rounds, you know, checking there's enough pillows, that sort of thing. So, <laughs> it's just us who are seeing him like that, the characters. 
So there he is anyway. He will start on A1 and make his way around. Next up uh, on the setup. Right. Obviously we've got to put doors on the board. We've got to put um, lockers and um, file uh, filing cabinets and things that we can search there on the board. There are a few tokens that we've put on the board. And there are monsters that we put on the board. Again, very much like the Warden. They're not actual monsters. Like the nurses in this are horrific. They're probably just normal nurses. Simulate some of the... We have mental patients that are probably just other mental patients. Rather than trying to kill us, they are probably just wandering, wandering around, you know, with uh, clutching a pillow or a soft toy or, you know, playing, uh, putting together a jigsaw puzzle somewhere or something like that. It's just us in our mania. We're seeing them differently. So all these things have to be put onto the board. The aesthetic of the game is very dark. The board is very dark. Now, it does show you on the board where things are meant to go, but it's extremely difficult to see. So one of those files I mentioned by Judgment Dave, it will actually show each tile, and it's highlighted in yellow where things go. So it makes it really easy to place stuff. Yeah. So again, I recommend to do that. There are... I'm using the Kickstarter doors. So you just put the Kickstarter doors and you put them down, and they're very easy to see very useful because obviously i'm doing a video of it so it sticks out these are just card stands you've seen me use them before i'm using these instead of the lockers and the filing cabinets because again it makes it easier to see and uh, what you can do is you do have them they do come with the game they're like flat but as you can see they're pretty difficult to see so there's um, an example of a locker, and that's another locker. They've got two different types. One's there, there's the filing cabinets. Now, they're exactly the same thing, it's just variety. Yeah, it's just a slightly different design. You, you can mix and match them, it doesn't matter what's on the board. If it's got, um, if on the board it's got a filing cabinet, you can use a locker instead, because when you flip them over, they've both got the, they've both got the same sort of stuff inside. They've either got equipment, medication, or weapons inside. Some do have... See if I can dig one out. I won't be able to find one now, probably. Um, oh, there's one. Uh, some do have, like, a monster on there. You can see that monster uh, icon here. That monster will only spawn if you don't get enough successes to get one of these things. So a monster will jump out at you. But generally we keep these in here. Now you could put them on the board. So that's the... What's that? That's the filing cabinets. And uh, you could just put them on the board where they're meant to be. But as you can see, that hardly sticks out at all. You can't see that, can you? You've got no chance. I can barely see it. I'm stood here. So rather than do that, I just pop that there. So we know there is something searchable in there. There's either a locker in there or a filing cabinet. So that's what all these yellow markers are. When we get to one and we want to search it, we will randomize the one that we're searching by picking it out of the bag. Then we'll get a search test and uh, hopefully we'll pass and uh, we'll be able to pick up some goodies out of there. So that's what the yellow markers are. Now, the doors actually come with the game, the Kickstarter. So uh, I've used those because they'll make it very easy for us to see where the doors are. There are a lot of door spaces. You don't have to use every door space. Uh, I'll show you that in a moment, um, just to show you how difficult it can be to set up and uh, how using Judgment Dave's helpful player aid will, uh, will indeed aid you a lot. The... Doors also have a flat equivalent. Dig one out. So there you go. Right, that's the flat equivalent of a door. Let's get rid of that door. Pop this there. And again, you can see how difficult it is to see for you guys. So that is why I'm using the actual Kickstarter door. But when we go to open one of these doors, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll have a look We'll pull one of these out of here, and then what you do is you flip it over. Now, this one, for example, is a barricade. 
So when we went to open that door, it's a barricade of two. So we need two successes to get rid of the barricade and go through the door. Some are locked, so they'll have a lock symbol and again another number, which is the value that you've got to exceed or match in order to get the door open. And some are just blank, that means the door is open. Yeah, so as we turn up towards doors, we'll try them, we'll pull a token out of the bag and we'll see whether it's open, whether it's uh, locked or whether it's barricaded. Um, as soon as a door's open, we just take it completely off the board, or unlocked or unbarricaded, we take it completely off the board, and then we know people can run back and forth through there willy-nilly. Okay, so that's the doors. Um, other stuff that we have to place on here include memory shrines. So this is where we can get our memories. I'll go through the memories when we actually have a look at the characters, but each character has a set of memories, ten. Five are personal to them, and five are generic. Yeah, and whenever you get to uh, a memory shrine, you can trigger these memories. Most of the time, they're nice. You get to, uh, you know, a benefit from it, but occasionally the odd one isn't so nice, yeah? So, uh, those are what memory shrines are. Pop that back there, I think it went there. The other type of token that we have is, oh, yes, a body token. There are two types of body token. Again, makes no real difference. One's not better than the other. It's just uh, so, you know, you've got a token that looks slightly different. Very similar to the lockers and the filing cabinets, completely interchangeable. And on the back of here, you will also get the opportunity to search a body. Now, the body may have um, a weapon on it. It may have medication on it or equipment, or it may actually have a spawn icon, in which case it's a monster and it jumps up and attacks you, yeah? So uh, these get placed on the board as well and one always goes in the centre here where the pentagram is. So we'll pop it there. And I think that is pretty much it for what you have to place on the board. Where, oh, apart from the monsters, I'll do those in a minute though. So how do you know where to place things? I'm just gonna zoom in and I'll just show you so it is marked off on the board, but I'll just show you how tricky it is to actually spot things. And here's a close up of a room in the D quadrant. This is uh, just got the entrance off to this side. Uh, don't worry about these here. You see those little uh, green pins there, just bobby pins. They're just to stop the, uh, because the tiles don't interlock together, it's just to stop them moving around. When you've got a load of things like these, you know, knocking around on the board, the worst thing you want to do is knock the tile because they go everywhere so that that just keeps them steady okay right so we have a door here why do we have a door there well if you actually look closely you can see it there can you see the little white outline the ghostly white outline well that tells you that a door goes there so whenever you see one of those pop a door on it you'll see there's another door here that does not have the ghostly white line around it. What that says is there's a doorway there, but the door isn't shut. It's open, yeah? So you don't put a door there. Now you can do if you want. If you want to make it a bit more difficult, you can put doors in these places. But generally, believe you me, the game's hard enough. <laughs> so just leave those open. In this case, you can just freely go in from the corridor here into the room. The door is open. Now, the uh, lockers... You'll see again, we've got another ghostly outline here. This is actually, on the board is a filing cabinet, but you could put a locker here, it doesn't matter. It's uh, they're completely interchangeable. So there's one there, so we know there'll be a locker there. And there's another one here, yeah. So again, I've just put a, another marker there. And what we'll do is, as soon as a character gets in here, starts searching these, or opening that door, that's when we go to the bags and we'll pull out a token and we'll find out what tests we've got to take in order to get the door open. Or, in the case of or, or the lockers or the filing cabinet, whatever we pick out. So, that is like the lockers and the doors. We'll come out again and um, I'll show you how we place the actual monsters. 
And here we are, we've zoomed out again. Okay, how do the monsters get placed? All the monsters on the board are basic monsters, apart from the Warden. But as I've said, he's mainly a timer in this game. You can fight him, but generally he's a timer. Um, the, the actual monsters that are on this board, which are the Grey Minis, they're basic monsters at the start. And we get one Scavenger and one Mental Patient per Quadrant. And, because we've got four characters, we also get two nurse monsters. They're another basic monster. If we had five characters, we'd have four nurses. Nurses are a bit tougher. They're still a basic monster, but they're a bit tougher. And they do have a, um, they do have a restriction when you set them up. You can only have one nurse in each quadrant. The others, doesn't matter. But uh, as far as nurses go, you can only have one nurse in each quadrant. Once the game gets going, and all the monsters start moving around, which they will, there is no um, limit to how many um, figures, never mind monsters, just um, figures, characters, whatever, that you can have in one space. But just as far as setup goes, you cannot have two nurses in the same quadrant, for example. Okay, setting them up, one for each quadrant. Remember, I mentioned each quadrant has 12 numbered spaces. Because you're, setting, because you're putting one into each space, all you do is just use your D12. Here's the rather nice dice got with the game. And uh, all you do is roll that. A five, you put your scavenger or your mental patient, whichever you've chosen, and uh, you place them into the quadrant. So I've done that for both the scavengers and the mental patients. So A here, the mental patient is in um, A8, the scavenger is in A9, over here in uh, B quadrant we have a mental patient in B1 and we have a scavenger in B11, over here in C quadrant we have a mental patient at C3 and we also have a mental patient um, we have a scavenger sorry at uh, C8 and in the D quadrant we have a mental patient at D5 and a scavenger at D10 so let's have a look at what these things are so we'll have a look at scavengers first here's the scavenger card and on its skills there it tells you it's basic now, this is probably just an orderly or, you know, a visitor, yeah, or, you know, a secretary or somebody who works, you know, um, a chef. <laughs> we see them as these horrible flesh-eating zombies, yes, but they're probably just normal people. Remember, we are insane. So, we see them like this. And as you can see, there's a lot of iconography here. I'll, I'll go through it quickly for you. So when they attack you, they will attack with five dice. Now, they've got a keyword here, which is precision. If they roll a six with any of those dice, it means it will ignore defense. So if you've got defense, doesn't matter. They've got precision. They know where to hit you, right? So that's what precision means. They have two actions, two action points. Now, action points are just for movement for these guys, yeah? Um, when they get onto your space, it doesn't matter how many action points they've got left or haven't got left, they will attack. So they always attack when they're on the same space. They don't run out of action points. The action points are just pretty much for moving around. Uh, it's got three health. That's what the drop means. The uh, cross swords, that means their attack rating. So they have to, on a D6, they've got to get a five or better. A five or six will be a hit. Remember, if they get six, it's precision. And uh, have they got any defense? No, they don't have any defense. We've got a bit of um, flavor text here. The old joke is that psychiatrists are doctors who can't stand the sight of blood. Maybe they can't stand it, but if they work here, they damn well better get used to it. Well, there you go, nice. So that's a scavenger. We'll have a look at the mini. So there's the mini of the scavenger. Very good minis. So, uh, excellent. So, these are scavengers, large, cadaverous zombie types. Uh, the other um, type of basic uh, monster that we've put on the board that we're discussing is the mental patient. Again, these are just normal, like, fellow inmates. 
yes um, they probably don't look like this they're probably sat at a table you know eating a bowl of jelly or playing putting putting a jigsaw together something like that um, they're not like this horrible ghoul that we see here but that is just the representation that we're having in our like you know our mass delusion that we're experiencing so these guys are basic as well he just has one action point again the one action point is just for moving they are on the same space as you they will attack whether they've spent that action point or not they have four health so they're a bit stronger and uh, but same attack rating five or a six on a d6 and they do have one defense the reason they have a defense is probably because they've got a straight jacket on so that's helping their defense they too roll five dice but they don't have precision yeah and they have a bit of flavor text as well i feel like i am gasping for air screaming for help but everyone just looks at me with confused faces wondering what i'm struggling with and then they are all doing just fine and it makes me feel crazy so that's your mental patient so we've seeded them on the board randomly remember one each in each quadrant then we've got to place two nurses the reason we're placing two nurses if we only had three characters then we wouldn't place any at all but uh, four characters is two nurses full five character game we would place four one in each quadrant remember you can't have, can't set them up as two in the same quadrant these are the nurses again these are a basic monster they have one action two they have five health but they hit on a four or better so a four five or six and they will hit they have one uh, defense and they roll six dice so they're pretty tough so the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty perpetrated by bad people but the fact that good people remain silent about it and that's the nurse so they're they're nasty nurses nasty nurses and uh, just for the sake of completeness um, I had to take this card out because as I say if we end up on the same space as the warden he will stomp on us but this is the one it's just to show you how absolutely impossible he is so he gets three actions his health depends on the amount of uh, characters that we're playing him he gets uh, he hits on a three or better so three four five and six he'll hit you he's got three defense which is huge and he's got a succession of attacks here that have got all sorts of um, you know extra abilities with them he is horrible so that's the warden now you've seen the warden mini but uh, i didn't show you the nurse mini so there's the nurse mini so as far as where the nurse went uh, we got one on d8 and we got another on b9 that's where they ended up if you've got to place a um if you've got to place anything sort of completely randomly i.e. it can be in any quadrant you use your d12 and you also use a d4 as you can see instead of numbers it's got you know a b c and d on it so if we just roll these you can see the whoop so plonk it in there we get c6 yep and then you just play something at c6 you'll see that during the game because at the end of um, every monster phase we have to place extra yeah so extra monsters will come out on the board depending on uh, what the movement card tells us so that is all of our monsters on the board to start with uh, similarly we've got to place these body tokens that i mentioned now they're particularly difficult to place um, if you do download judgment dave's file um he does show places where you can actually put these there's about three or four different um places on a quadrant that you can put them you just choose randomly where you're going to put them and that's what i've done here so all of the there's one per quadrant so we've got one up here with the scavenger i think that's in a8 is it oh no sorry a9 and i knew i was going to knock those over <laughs> we've got another one here in b11 and there's one down here just in the corridor and there's one here just at the reception desk let me just put these back ah, i knew i was gonna hit them damn it right those are back up now right so we've placed them and it's exactly the same for these memory shrines 
yeah, we get two of those per quadrant. I just rolled and uh, we got them here. So these brains on the black to the white brains on the black tokens, there are two of those in each quadrant. And uh, if we want to regain a memory, that's where we go and we interact with them. So that's the board set up. It, uh, it takes a while for me to talk through it there. And if you actually read it in the manual, take a while, you know, while you put everything down there. Take a while while, while you search and like peer at the board to see if you can see any ghostly outlines. But uh, if you get Judgment Dave's player aids, it will quicken it up. No, it just like it just makes it so much easier. So I do once again recommend you go and download those, and you can get it done in 15 minutes. Dead easy. Right, so that is all set up and ready to go. Right, oh, so what do we? What will we have a discussion about next? I think we'll just have a quick chat about the scenario. Once we've gone through the scenario, then we'll have a look at our characters. So uh, let's go and have a look at the scenario. Okay, I'm back, the scenarios. Now you do get scenario cards and uh, the actual scenarios themselves are in the rule book. As mentioned, Judgment Dave has done some rewrites of those and uh, you'll see that at the end of this video. If you actually pause near the end, you'll see me game tracker that I normally put at the end of my playthroughs and uh, you'll see it on there and you can see his version of it. Now, uh, there is a deck that's called the Scenario Deck and these are scenario cards and we've picked out Asylum Field Day. The reason is that this is the easiest. It's the easiest to set up and it's the easiest to play. And uh, it shows you these coloured stars. You'll see what those are when I go through the um, go through the scenario. And it gives you the basic objective: a set number of monsters to defeat, items to find, and memories to regain. And a next scenario trigger. When three out of the five objectives are finished, then you will start the next scenario. If you're doing more than one scenario, this is what makes it really difficult. This is another thing that makes it really difficult is uh, you haven't actually finished a scenario yet and another one kicks off and uh, you'll get all the uh, any additional monsters or elites or whatever join in on that next scenario and you haven't even finished this one yet so it's just another way that this is such a hard difficult game just to show but if you only do the single scenario obviously that won't kick in okay so we're here we've got one two i've, I've picked three others um, because Judgment Dave's Files does have a list of what are the easiest. So, Asylum Field Day is the easiest. These three are a selection of the next easiest, yeah? Because some of them are just really, really bad, yeah? The easy scenarios are bad. Some of the others are just unbelievable. So, that's Asylum Field Day. I'll go into the details because obviously they haven't been able to fit um that much onto this card but uh, these are useful you know if you're just picking a scenario randomly just shuffle the deck and pick one out so pop that back there go on stay on there it's stayed on okay just before i go into details in the scenario i'll just show you some of the decks that are involved in the game we have Here's an example of a skills deck. Your skills are based on various uh, mental disorders. So, for example, we've got aggression. There's also an OCD deck, a schizophrenia deck, an anxiety neurosis deck, and a phobia deck. And these have all sorts of skills that you can use. We'll go through that when we go through the characters. So, that's an example of the uh, skill deck. We also have item decks. So, we've got various pieces of equipment yeah so we've got an equipment deck this is the sort of thing you can find in those lockers and filing cabinets meds yeah get those as well and they will give you special bonuses and weapons all sorts of weapons and stuff that you can pick up and uh, you do that obviously by searching yeah other decks that they're not actually used in the won't be using in this game um, a couple of these decks are from the expansion which is from the deep that expansion is basically saying there's a cellar underneath the mental hospital that goes down to an underground river and it's full of deep ones and stuff like that it's all very Cthulhu and uh, that's what the rituals deck is that comes with the expansion 
as does uh, the artifacts like you can get artifacts and stuff we won't be dealing with artifacts in this particular game because we're just dealing with the psychiatric hospital itself you also have a movement deck now this is like your mythos cards all these are bad yeah and they tell you how you're going to spawn how many monsters to spawn there are those um stars colored stars so depending on what the scenario tells you you have to do something um based on that star um they see the brain that means you put an extra uh, memory shrine out for example one ah there we go there's the warden that means move the warden one and you also get some events at the top here where it'll tell you to do stuff these cards are bad <laughs> So these will spawn monsters, they will move monsters, and uh, they affect the timer. They also make you do bad things, um, do horrible tests to avoid horrible penalties, all that sort of thing. So that's the movement deck. Right, back to the scenario. The scenario we're doing is Asylum Field Day. And as I've mentioned, I do recommend you start with this one. It is the easiest one. The reason I say that is if you actually go to the scenarios part of the rule book, it starts with memories. Now, uh, that is very hard. It's hard to set up and it's very hard to um, win. They're all pretty hard to win, but this espe these especially so, yeah. So uh, if you started, if you didn't know and just were playing the game straight out of the box, you may think, oh, right, this is the first scenario. I recommend you do not do it because it is so difficult. We're doing the um, Asylum Field Day. So I'll get to that one, which is a few pages in. And this one's just got a bit more detail on it. So we've got a set number of monsters to defeat, items to find and memories to regain. There's no particular setup, so we've just picked four quadrants. But if there was, it mentioned here that we needed a specific tile, for example. Prepare a pen and a sheet of paper to count the objectives or use dice to mark your progress. Don't worry, faithful viewers. I've got all that sorted out in the background, so you don't need to worry about that. So here are the objectives. We've got to defeat scavengers, which is the number of players plus one. So we've got to defeat five of them. We've got to defeat mental patients. Again, number of players plus one. We've got to defeat five of them. Defeat nurses, number of players, so that'll be four. D, find item cards in lockers, so it doesn't matter whether it's medication, uh, equipment, or a weapon, as long as we find something. That's the number of players plus one, so we'll need five of those items. And pick up memory tokens, so uh, again, we'll need to pick up five of those. The next scenario trigger, well, I mentioned that it was on the card. When you've done three out of the five above, the next scenario will come in. If we're doing a next scenario, then we'll do that. But uh, if I decide one's enough, then we won't. <laughs> oh, there's an example of typos, as you see. You can't spell trigger right. Um, but again, you know, no big thing against the designers of the game. You know, English is obviously not their first language. I think they're Polish. But uh, there are a few things like that through here, th throughout the rule book and a, few, a bit of the grammar and the odd sentence comes across a bit odd but um, it's by no means unreadable okay special events right so that's what this is what those stars mean a green star or surge means one point of progress in one of the objectives chosen by the players is cancelled so say you've got four you've killed four scavengers it'd go back down to saying you'd killed three scavengers yeah so that's bad uh, for the blue It'll be three points of progress in any number of objectives chosen by the players is cancelled. So you could take off a nurse or two of the items that you've found counts as not being found, that sort of thing. Um, it's just the progress here. Yeah, you don't lose the item. Yeah, it's just the progress. So you just uh, you just have to find more items to replace the ones that um, you're counting as not being found. And for a red star, it'll be during your next turn, you cannot progress any objective. So it doesn't matter what you kill, what you pick up, what memories you regain, you just uh, they just don't count against your progress. So the red surge is pretty bad. So that's Asylum Field Day. As I say, Judgment Dave has rewritten those to make them a bit clearer. And uh, if you want to look at that, you'll actually see a representation of it at the end of the video in on the game tracker there. So you can have a look at that. Right, so that is the scenario. We've got to kill 
five of these um five of these scavengers five of these mental patients four of the nurses and we've got to find five items in lockers and we've got to find and experience five of our memories we've got to regain them you'll notice that currently we do not have enough scavengers and mental patients or nurses on the board that's okay there soon will be yeah <laughs> They spawn every single turn, so uh, we'll soon have more than enough. So whereas we couldn't actually fulfill those objectives right now with the number of monsters on the board, believe you me, there'll be more than enough to fulfill those objectives before we before we, you know, uh, get too far along in this playthrough. Okay, right. So there we are. All that set up. The scenario's gone through. Let's go through our characters and then we will be ready to start the game. And here we are at the character area. Four characters. We have Bernard Smith here. We have uh, Beatrice Amanda Dolly. She's here. And we have Nicholas Jackson here. And we have Helena Swan here. I'll go through each of them in turn. Let's have a look at their minis first though. So in isolation cell A, the uh, the green bottomed mini is actually uh, Bernard. So that's Bernard's mini. It should be easy to spot. What you know, as well as having these uh, bases that have just clipped on here, they are in brown plastic rather than grey. The monsters will be in grey plastic. So he's in isolation cell A. And Beatrice, she's in an isolation cell B. She's got the purple base. You see she's um, a very nice uh, young teenage lady who's uh, going around cutting things up by the by the looks of it. So that's Beatrice, isolation cell B. Isolation cell C is Nicholas Jackson. As I say, you can play a little game on who these are supposed to be, you know, as a horror cliche. Um, I'll tell you this one, seeing as you've probably got it anyway, this is obviously Jack Torrance out of The Shining, and Nicholas Jackson is a play on Jack Nicholson. So he's even got a little, um, even got a little fire axe there. Wendy, I'm home. So there you go. So he is in isolation C. And finally, we have Helena Swan. She's yellow. Um, Nicholas was red. Helena is yellow, and uh, there she is using her mind powers. Yeah, so Helena is in isolation cell D. Okay, so Bernard, he was first up. And uh, just to take you through the layout of where I've got everything, at the top here, the black and white cards, those are memory cards. I believe I mentioned it right at the beginning, but five of those memories are specific to him, five are generic memories. So what you'll find is each one of our characters has five specific memories to themselves, five generic ones. The generic ones, obviously we'll get to see them quite a lot. Uh, there's only five generic ones, so they will come back and back and back, which is unfortunate. Um, a larger pool of these generic uh, memories would have been nice, but uh, we're just stuck with five. So unfortunately, certain memories you'll see again and again and again. But uh, they do have five memories that are specific to themselves, so they're still a pretty good mix. Uh, those memories can be a boon most of the time. Some of them are bad, though. Some You'll have to do a test or something to avoid a penalty or things like that. But uh, generally, you'll get something good out of it. And uh, next to their memories, each player has these tokens, these blue tokens. Now, I've nicked these from 1066 Tears to Many Mothers because uh, the tokens in the game I, I was running out so I've just added these you just use them on the skill cards you'll see how we use them on the skill cards uh, when I get round to it um, but it's just extra tokens you do have tokens with the game you have some blue ones that are like this and you have some red ones but I just find you need a few extra so uh, I've just co-opted them in that's what they're there for the skills will go here to the right of the player card. Uh, you can only ever have six in total. So as you can see, there's just enough room to put six in there. Uh, immediately below the player card is the weapon that they're using. So I'll put the weapons in here. And there's also two face down cards here. These are 
the skills which are specific to each character. There's a total of four and um, you either pick two or you randomly choose two. I, I randomly chose for everything on here. And uh, right on the top row of the skills, those will be specific to each character. And the ones that are beneath are the ones that they get from their mental disorders, which I'll show you in a moment. That grey uh, token there, that's the first player token. So Bernard will be our first player. So that's the general set out. So every character has the gen same general set, set out. Um, let's have a look at Bernard's card. And uh, there's one of them blue markers. And uh, I'll show you what that's used for. It's, uh, the re it's not staying on there by magic. I've just blue tacked it on a bit. So it doesn't go uh, wandering off anyway. So here's Bernard. And uh, I'll go through the iconography here at the bottom. So this light bulb, that's his, um, that's his imagination. So his imagination of six. You do a lot of tests regarding imagination. Remember, we're insane. We're imagining everything. So if uh, we do an imagination test and pass it, then we can get things done. Yes. So uh, the higher the imagination, the better. He's got an imagination of six. He's got the shield is a defense, so he's got a defense of one. If he were to take three damage, for example, then that defense would take would soak up one of those damage and it'd go down to two. His attack rating is five. So on a D6, he will hit on a five or a six. Anybody who's played Arkham Horror, Eldritch Horror, things like that, be used to successes on a five or a six, and that's what it is with Bernard. He's got nine health, which is pretty good. And uh, he's also got four actions a turn, which is amazing. Normally it's three. He's got four. He's a star. So he can get extra things done. But as you can see, he's super fit. So he just, you know, he, he, can, get, he can get plenty done each turn. Let's have a read of his flavour text. Bernard Smith became a con artist early in his life. He has made a hobby out of breaking out of jail. When at large, he goes on violent crime sprees with no regard to eluding law enforcement. Transferred to the asylum after all hopes for re-socialisation were lost. So there you go. Now, his mental disorder, he has two, aggression and OCD. And what these mean is you can choose a skill from either aggression or OCD. Yeah, in this game, because you're insane, the disorders that you have wrong with you, your your mental illnesses give you powers. Remember, we're deluded, we're insane. Yeah, and that'll and um, that'll come important when I explain this track down here. So whatever's up with us, we think it's a superpower. It isn't. We just think it is because we're deluded just in the same way that we think the nurses are demonic that the hotel administrator is a demon that sort of thing so we think they give us superpowers and abilities uh, starting equipment is broken glass we'll have a look at that shortly that's his weapon uh, this um like blood drop in here that's just where we'll pop those red tokens and remember he's got nine health so when he gets nine tokens in here he'll have been knocked out yes he also gets a special ability his special ability is x con you can leave spaces with monsters on on them for two action points normally if you're on a space with a monster you cannot leave that space you have to fight them and kill them before you can move but he can spend an extra action point because look at him he's a tough guy shove him out of the way get he can escape and uh, so he can escape actual monsters on his space as long as he spends an additional action point now this down here is his sanity track it's not his insanity track, it's his sanity track, and I'll explain how it works. We are already insane, yeah? We are totally insane. We start the game insane. We can spend sanity points to fuel various abilities, but when we spend those insanity points, we actually become more lucid. We essentially become more sane. So as we're spending insanity points, we're regaining sanity. We're not losing it, we're regaining it. And that is how it kicks in with these uh, abilities that we get up here. As it is, we're totally insane and we believe we can do all these things. Yeah, we believe like we can walk through doors or whatever our particular ability is. But 
As we spend our insanity points and become more lucid, what happens is reality becomes more of a perception to us. Till eventually, when we've spent all of these points, we actually have a lucid episode where we're not insane. We just sort of wake up and look around and we're wondering what we're doing in the corridor of a mental asylum with a load of nurses trying to help us back to our room. Nurses that look like normal nurses. Orderlies that look like normal orderlies. Because you are no, you're having a lucid episode. You're still insane. I mean, you know, it's just an episode of lucidity. Um, it's, your mental illness hasn't been cured. But um, the delusional episode that you were having has sort of like subsided. And uh, you just get taken back to your room. Yeah. So that's how this works. So in a lot of other trackers, you're losing your sanity, aren't you? You're losing your sanity, then you go insane. In this particular game, you're already insane. And the more that you regain your sanity, the more that your so-called special abilities are harder to use. So that is how that works. And what we'll do is, as we spend insanity points, we just move it up this track here. You'll see... We've got plus one CD here and plus two CD here on the five and the six. That is cooldowns, and you'll see what those are in a second, because I'll go through skills shortly. Okay, so that's his player card. Pop that down there. Just before we get onto skills, he did get a weapon, which was broken glass. As you can see, the aesthetic again, it's very dark, um, unfortunately, and you can barely see it, but this is broken glass. This is a weapon, it gives him five dice. Now, you don't need a weapon, you can use your fists. Your fists count as three dice, but uh, you don't need a card for that, it's just the default. But uh, it's best to use a weapon, yeah, you get more dice. So he gets five dice, and he also, you may modify the result of one die by one. So you can, like, say you rolled a three, you could move it up to a four. Or, say you rolled a one, you could move it up to a two. Why would you move a 1 up to a 2? You'd probably missed anyway. Well, that's because of the durability. The durability here is 5. But every time you roll those dice, if you roll a 1, you lose a durability. Now, it's only 1-1 one, one, one per roll. So, say you rolled 5 1s. You don't lose 5 durability. It just means if on any given roll, you roll at least 1-1, one, one, then you'll lose a durability. Yeah? So that's how that works. So say you rolled four fives and a one, you might want to, because your fives had hit, it might be the one that you might want to increase by one because by moving it up to a two, it means you don't lose a durability on your weapon. So that's what that means. So that's his broken glass. So he's picked that up from somewhere and that's what he's using as a weapon. Okay, his skills. Ooh. We'll do his... Uh, personal skills first so he's got a pool of four there's two down there that he might have the opportunity to get it depends um there is an opportunity to pick up further skills so that's why they're face down but the two that he got randomly were street smarts this is a utility skill it's got uh, no cost and you can either recover two health or remove a door token from your space remember you're doing that without an action doesn't cost anything whereas normally looking at a door you'd have to make a test if it was locked or barricaded you'd have to make a test to try and get rid of it he can just get rid of it by using this special ability or automatically pass a search test draw two cards from a single inventory deck put one in your inventory and discard the other so again he doesn't have to make a search test so this is the sort of guy who can just go up to one of those yellow tokens and uh, we don't even have to pick it out of the bag. Yeah, we don't have to pick the um, corresponding locker token out of the bag. He can just go straight to the inventory and that would count for the items. You know, the items on our objectives for Asylum Field Day. So this is excellent. Now, this track down the side, this is your cooldown track. So the bright ones here, that is what we'll use most of the time. So if he uses street smart, we'll put a marker on four. And uh, then we start cooling it down from there. And uh, there are ways to move this down to refresh it. One is every round it'll move down anyway. Secondly, if you kill something. If you kill one of the monsters, then you can 
you have a look at all your um, skills that are on cooldown and you can move one down yeah can't move all of them down just uh, pick one one monster one move one cooldown remember as i said you get lucid so when you reach that part of your track where it's got plus one cd then the cooldown would be five when it's plus two cd the cooldown will be six so that's what this means yeah the more sane you get the more difficult it is to use these weird powers that you think you have because you're more sane and reality tells you that i can't do any of these weird things yeah so that's how that works his other uh, personal skill is hit and run this is an attack again there's no cost up there what this means is it means a weapon that you're using and that includes your fists so if uh, he didn't even have his broken glass, his fist would count here. And uh, he gains plus two range and an extra d attack die. So it was five for the broken glass. It'd go up to six if you use this. And uh, it'd get two range. Normally he'd have to be on the same space. But this card, hit and run, would give him like um, an uh, two range. Essentially sort of rushes out either glasses or punches the person and then rushes back hit and run yeah so that's what he does with this special ability again the cooldown's quite low it's three um but once he starts getting more sane and more lucid then uh, the cooldown will get bigger so those are his two personal ones and because he had aggression and ocd we were allowed an aggression or an ocd skill out of those decks i showed you earlier Randomly it got an aggression one, and the one he picked up was dual wield, which is an attack. Again, there's no uh, no cost up there. Attack with two different weapons as one action. So if we can get him another uh, weapon, well, in fact, he's got two weapons now. He's got his fists, and he's got the broken glass, yeah? Uh, but if we can get him another weapon as well as the broken glass, then um, which is a bit more useful than fists, then uh, he can be a bit of a beast and uh, he can dual wield those uh, two items for just one attack so he can do more damage roll more dice uh, that cooldown is three unless he's lucid and then obviously the cooldown gets longer so that's dual wield and that is bernard and he's going to be our first player after him we have beatrice amanda dolly so let's have a look at her And here she is, and her um, imagination is six. She has uh, zero defense, unfortunately, but her attack rating is amazing. So on a three or better, she will hit. So that's a three, four, five, or six. So that's amazing. She's only got seven health, unfortunately, and uh, she only has three actions that she can do. Her special ability, unlimited mind power. Use one action and discard any of your skills to draw a skill from any disorder deck. The disordered, the, the, sorry, the discarded skill can't be on cooldown. So she can't discard one that she's currently already used and hasn't refreshed yet. And uh, her mental disorder, she's got all of them. Yeah, so that's why her ability, she can use any uh, skill out of any disorder deck. Starting equipment, she gets a kitchen knife. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Her flavour text. Beatrice Amanda Dolly was admitted to the asylum when her stepfather accused her of assaulting her little sister. The girl is currently awaiting a lobotomy procedure while staring blankly at the wall. One can only wonder what is going on inside her mind. <laughs> okay, so here is her insanity track. She's more insane than even Bernard because as you see her track goes up to seven his only went up to six and uh, so it'll take her longer to get saner and more lucid yeah so she's got more points she can spend to buff up her uh, her imaginary abilities and uh, yes she is a bit of a beast so she's uh, really good at fighting that's hitting on a three four five or six is just huge so that's Beatrice. Uh, we'll have a look at uh, what she can do just after we have a look at her weapon. She's got the kitchen knife. So it's only four dice, but you may modify the result of two dice by one each. 
So whereas for the broken glass, Bernard could do it at just the single dice, she can do it with two. And the kitchen knife is a bit more durable. It's got six durability there. So she's got a kitchen knife. And let's have a look at her skills. I'll just go around and get them. Ugh, pick up all three this time. So the first two skills, these are the ones that we got randomly out of her deck of four. We've got Dancing Queen, which is a defense. Cost none. Um, recover two health and gain avoidance four for this round. What avoidance is, is um, if you get hit, then you can roll a die. And the four there means, say she gets hit three times, she'd roll a d6 three times. If she got a four or better, she could avoid that damage. That's what it means. So if she rolled uh, three sixes, then she wouldn't take any damage at all. She'd successfully avoid those hits. If she rolled three ones, she'd get hit three times because she couldn't avoid them properly. It's just a way of, um, you know, a way of avoiding damage, basically. And uh, this cooldown is three. Again, if she's in the... Um, she's right up there on the lucidity track, it will get higher. But uh, Dancing Queen, yeah, that's a good defence. The other one, personal one, that we picked out for her was Brain Overdrive. It's a utility skill, but this does have a cost. It will cost us an action point to play this. Use your unlimited mind power ability, but ignore the last sentence. Ah, okay, yes. Remember her unlimited mind power, whereby she could uh, get rid of one of her skills. She could discard it and pick a fresh one. But it couldn't be on cooldown. That is what the last sentence was. It can't be on cooldown. Well, she's got brain overdrive. That means she can ignore the last sentence. So this is a huge card. So anything that we couldn't use anyway because it was on cooldown, we can now discard and get a fresh one, which isn't on cooldown. So this is a very strong ability. Uh, probably why its cooldown's a bit longer. So it's four. Once she starts getting lucid, it can move up to five or six. So brain overdrive, very good. Now, she's got every single disorder, from schizophrenia, phobia, like anxiety, neuroses, the lot. So um, I had to pick out of all five of those decks, and um, she ended up getting, I think it's uh, aggression, yeah, it's an aggression one. So, Psycho Gambler, attack. So, roll 2d6. The result is the number of attack dice for this attack, so we could get up to 12 dice, yeah, for this single attack. If the result is six or lower, so if we end up with six dice or lower, the attack gains precision. So even if we roll low, if on, say we end up getting five dice, we roll those five dice, any of those five dice score a six, they've got precision, which means they will ignore defense. So uh, this is very strong Psycho Gambler. It's got a cooldown of four normally, and uh, the increased loot lucidity puts that up by one or two there so those are three very strong cards for uh, Beatrice who's uh, a bit of a beast all things considered right well, I'll put these back and we'll move on to uh, Nicholas so Nicholas let's have a quick look yes Jack Torrance Jack Nicholson Nicholas Jackson here he is now, his imagination is um, slightly higher than the previous two. He's got seven imagination. He also has a higher defense of two. He hits on a four, five, or six, and so not as good as Beatrice, but he's that's pretty good. He's still hitting half the time. He has um, good health at nine, and he too has three action points. And down here, his special ability is unstoppable. Use one action point and put any skill on cooldown as if it was used to remove a door token from your space so he can just go through doors yeah i suppose that's to do with the shining you know and using that fire axe just to bash his way through a door so he can use uh, one of his skills put it on cooldown and he can just get rid of a door can be useful because a lot of the time you are running from monsters in this game so being able to run through doors very useful what's his flavor text Nicholas Jackson is a borderline hoarder and suffers from social anxiety. He works as a night guard in a secluded location where he becomes overwhelmed by his fears. Because of all the stuff he hoards, those places are not exactly shining afterwards. Oh, dear me. Oh, see what they did there. 
Right, his mental disorder, anxiety, neurosis and OCD. And his starting equipment is a wrench. We'll have a look at that in a moment. And his uh, insanity track goes up to six. So uh, he's not quite as insane as Beatrice. Yeah. And uh, that is Nicholas. So we'll pop him back there. Let's have a quick look at his wrench. This is his weapon. So five dice if he attacks with this. You may lose one durability to recover one durability to a weapon on your space. It can be another character's weapon. So you can either use it as a tool to repair something or you can use it to bludgeon somebody. But if you repair somebody else's weapon or perhaps even one of Nicholas's other, if he gets another weapon, then you will use durabilities up here. Durability is six. That's in addition to anything you lose for rolling a one, for example. So that's the wrench. The two abilities we pick randomly from his personal abilities is room by room, utility, cost none, move two spaces in any direction, gain plus one to attack rolls and avoidance five for this round. Already discussed avoidance, this case it's avoidance five, so instead of rolling a four you have to roll a five or better, so it's not quite as good as Beatrice's ability. But getting the plus one to an attack roll and being able to move two spaces as well, excellent. Uh, cooldown of four, unless um, he's nearly sane, in which case it goes up to as much as six. His other personal ability is hibernation utility, costs an action point. Gain plus one defense for this round. Remember, he's already got two defense, so that would give him three defense, which would be huge. At the end of the round, recover D3 health if you have not lost any health during the round. So again, good, good, good ability. And um, that is hibernation. It's got a cooldown of four. Unless you start getting lucid, then it can move up to six. Very good. So that's room by room and hibernation. He had anxiety, neurosis and OCD. So when I randomly pick this, we got an OCD. That was it. And it was shifting strike attack. So he can roll seven dice if he uh, kicks this one into gear. Each monster damaged by this attack is teleported to a random space. This can be huge because this game you can get swarmed. Yeah, in fact, one of my house rules is to do with that. I'll go through that next episode. But uh, yes, you can get swarmed. So something like this is really helpful when you've got about 15 monsters on you. But um, yeah, being able to move monsters away, brilliant. And huge cooldown though five normally and uh, once you start getting lucid it can go up to seven so that is shifting strike okay so that's nicholas and our final character is helena swan here she is this is helena swan she has seven imagination as well which is good she also has a defense she hits on a four five or six as well and she's our most healthy character she's got 10 health and she has three action points her special ability is afterlife. After dealing a final blow to a monster, recover one health. Always useful. Helena Swan. Helena Swan claims to have been born in 1774. She is able to talk about her life in Victorian England with astonishing detail. She suffers from photophobia and cl clinical vampirism, admitted to the asylum after being linked to several cases of cannibalism. Isn't she nice? Just one thing there. 1774 is actually Georgian England, not in <laughs> not Victorian England. Victorian England didn't come along till about 1820, something like that. Um, not exactly sure when... Um, Queen Victoria was crowned, but it wasn't 1774. And in fact, any of my American friends will know that because of the War of Independence and uh, George III, who was on the throne at the time. That was 1776. So, uh, yes, Georgian England. Uh, her mental disorder is uh, schizophrenia and OCD. And her starting equipment is a gas pipe. Her insanity track here goes up to seven, so she's pretty crazy as well. She uh, she, she, she takes a lot for her to get um, to get lucid. Oh, just one part on these. Um, say you're up on seven here, and um, you lost gained another sanity point, as it were. Then um, yes, you have a lucid episode, and you just get escorted back to the isolation cells. Yep, yeah, you sort of come to wonder what what you're doing, and uh, they escort you back there. So that's what happens when uh, 
exactly the same as if um, you know she got 10 damage in here you just end up getting escorted back to your isolation cell um, there are other penalties when that happens like the warden starts moving a bit more and stuff like that but uh, you'll see that during the game right so Helena let's have a look at her weapon gas pipe again ridiculously dark aesthetic you can barely see it but it is a gas pipe and uh, just five dice so it's just a normal piece of pipe you don't get anything special with it you just get five dice and you try and brain things with it um five durability gas pipe okay pop that back her abilities the two we picked from her personal abilities were hypnotizing eyes attack as you can see she thinks she's a vampire that's her delusion yeah so uh, she has vampire type abilities so attack she gets eight dice and it has a range of one if this attack deals damage you can move one space in any direction and recover one health so again vampirism you know you're sort of taking sustenance off your victims and uh, she can also move one space in any direction so that's very useful as well you get to attack and move it's got a large cooldown because it's a strong ability so five normally but as she gets more lucid it can go up to seven shadow step ability i was glad i picked this one out um utility cost none gain ethereal movement this round this is huge ability now a lot of the elite monsters in this game have ethereal and that means you can pass through walls generally you can't go through walls in this game unless you're ethereal and uh, i think the only sort of character that can manage to do it is actually helena and again it's like turning into gaseous form as a vampire so she thinks she can do this and uh yes being able to walk through walls is huge because it's a real pain when you've got an elite on the board that can do it <laughs> because you're going no it's just gonna walk through a wall uh, well helena can do it as well it's just great for getting away from other monsters or you know if you've got to you've got to get to something like a you know search a locker or something um rather than walk the whole way around you can just take a shortcut through a wall so this is a really strong ability so hypnotizing guys and shadow step are her personal abilities skills that she picked and out of OCD and schizophrenia, we got oh a schizophrenia one, that was it. And it was faith healing utility. Costs one action point to play, but you can recover four health. And uh, that's to any character that she can see that's in line of sight within five spaces, including herself. Yeah. And uh, so that's really good for uh, healing people up. So again, that's why it's got a huge cooldown here of five. More lucid she can she gets, it might get up to seven. But that is a very good ability as well. So we'll pop that there. There we go. Those are our characters. We've got four characters, so it's going to be a busy little game keeping uh, track of everything because you've got to keep track of special abilities and each skill. They can get more skills as they go along, so it can get a bit busy. But I have my notebook so hopefully I won't make too many errors he says ho 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 but we shall see so those are our first characters Bernard is our first character okay I think that is pretty much it for the introduction and setup I hope you enjoyed it just a quick word about house rules I've mentioned a couple that I use um, the timer being one whereby um, I don't have the boss fight with the warden when the timer runs out I just carried the timer on that is one of them and um, there are a few more that I use I'll, I'll tell you them as I come up to them but the main reason I do it is and I have mentioned it in this uh, particular episode it's a crazy hard game it's really difficult I think it does need house rules to make it a little less difficult because uh, if a new gamer was just to pick this out of the box, you know, I mean, I've, I I do quite a bit of gaming. You you guys probably do. But if somebody just picked this out of the box, not having played a board game before, it, it wouldn't be long before it went back in the box. They'd just think it was just ridiculously hard. And, be, and the reason is, it is. Um, and even I feel, and I'm lucky, you know, I'm pretty lucky with dice. I'm the first to admit it. 
and uh, yeah I still I think it's hard so I'm gonna make it a little bit easier on myself whether you agree with that or not um, <laughs> doesn't really matter because I'm gonna use them anyway anybody who wants to use those house rules you as you see them um, you're more than happy to, I'm more than happy for you to use them you know knock yourself out make up your own house rules it's all about having fun if you think something is too difficult or flip side of the coin if you think something's too easy house rule it to make it more difficult yeah just uh, never be afraid to uh, mess around with rules in games and I say that for people you know some people might just completely break a game but you know what if you enjoy playing it do it that way yeah I'm not one here to preach what you do with your games um, but this particular one I have mentioned it because there are a few house rules that I will use in this game as I as, as we come up to them I'll mention them but the basic reason why I do it is I think this game is a little bit too hard I think um, I think when they designed it they've designed it slightly too hard and um, it, it makes it difficult to get into and it's a pity because it's a great game there's a great game in here and um, I just think it's a little too hard at the beginning so when you start off you can be really beaten into the dust um, I've got no problems with it being harder later on you know once you've um, you know had a good hour playing the game and think you're doing okay and then getting stomped then great you know fine but um just stomping you from the get-go which um has happened in this game and in fact if you have a look at any of the playthroughs on um youtube you can see it happen where it is quite brutal um mentioning that actually there's some good ones to watch uh, chits and cats callisto she's done a, a playthrough of lobotomy as has the lonesome gamer uh johannes and uh, doug good old dog he's done one as well which is well worth a watch and uh, the grey board gamer though the grey board gamers it's an excellent watch but he hasn't finished it i don't know why i hope he's okay but uh, he's only done a couple of episodes but well worth watching even that even though it hasn't finished it does go through how to play the game really well so have a look at those and you can see how brutal the game is without house rules and uh, as i say anybody who's done four scenarios of this and one well done but um you probably got a rule wrong somewhere because uh, rules is written i think it's impossible to do four scenarios of this <laughs> and you'll see when we play this game um asylum field day is the easiest they have been ranked go to judgment dave's thread and uh, there is a list of um what are the hardest to set up what are the hardest to actually play asylum field day is the easiest as I say, I've got three backed up behind it. See how we go. Again, they're all fairly easy as well. Not as easy as Asylum, but uh, fairly easy. And we'll see how far we get. We won't do a um, last battle against the Warden, but we we might see, you know, uh, we might use my um, backwards victory track just to see how much we miss the timer by. Okay, and uh, yeah, I've got some other house rules regarding um, monster movement and things like that just to make it a bit easier. But as I say, I will go through those at the time. All right, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction and setup for Lobotomy and Asylum Field Day. Um, anything that you've noticed was wrong, you know, aside from the house rules, you know, um, anything that I've missed, uh, by all means, please let me know and I can fix it in, in time for the first turn. And, um, yeah, thank you for watching. Thanks for all the subscriptions, the likes, the dislikes, and for all the help and support as ever. As mentioned just then, yeah, any mistakes, let me know. We'll, uh, we'll get them sorted for uh, the first turn. Uh, thanks to everybody who's been to Board Game Links to upvote the site with nearly 100 likes, so that's that's amazing. Thank you. And uh, similarly, anybody on BGG who'd liked any of my video threads over there, made a comment, liked, or drop geek gold, thank you so much. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter followers, don't forget you guys, thank you very much. And yes, that is it for the introduction and setup of Lobotomy. I hope you join me for episode one. But until then, this is me, Cat Weasel, signing off. Toodaloo!